Thank you, Mary Ortega, council members. My name is Jim Davis. I live, reside at 27483 North 103rd Way, Scottsdale, 85262. I'm here tonight on behalf of the Coalition of Greater Scottsdale, or COGS. Uh, most of you are familiar with it. Uh, we are here to ask the council to consider adding a conversation about physical sustainability. It is not covered in this plan, and COGS strongly believes that physical sustainability for the city of Scottsdale is more critical, more important, and deserves more attention, even in the discussion tonight. And we'd like to appreciate that discussion. The uh, city is underinvesting in its assets. Over the last seven years, the streets have depreciated by $60 million. The uh, additions were such that they did not cover the depreciation. So $10 million a year almost in deficiency in terms of spending. And as you all discussed earlier on the water and sewer systems, the costs have escalated. So that deficiency in terms of mileage of streets is even more significant. The city approved in 2019 a bond project to cover some 800 to 300 million dollars of an, a total of 800 plus million that were identified as needed projects. Many of those projects should have been covered in the annual operating budgets. So again, the city is under investing in its assets. The week. Uh, Cogs believes that the city is not physically sustainable. And we point to a number of indicators. The uh, first thing is, of course, to recognize how valuable tourism is. We all know that, and we know that physical sustainability means keeping the tourism and the high, resident, high income, high net worth residents in Scottsdale. By doing that, we will help maintain the lower tax base and the fiscal sustainability. By not doing that, we have the opposite situation. The uh, Scottsdale also is uh, expanding significantly the high density residential development. COGS firmly believes that that is a net negative to the fiscal sustainability of the city. The additional residents in those high density residential uh, units do not pay enough residue, uh, revenue to the city to cover the costs of providing the safety and the services that those residents require. And additionally, of course, the high, resident, high, high density residents frequently represent a number of stories they interrupt the views and, dis and discourage tourism and high density and high uh, net worth residents. The bars in the entertainment district do not generate enough revenue to the city to pay for the safety costs. These are just two examples of drags on the city's fiscal sustainability that deserves the city council's attention and COG's judgment and COGS would welcome a conversation on physical sustainability on the part of the city council and the community in large, because we think that physical sustainability is critical to everything that goes on in the city and it's certainly to its future. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank and you, attention. sir. Um, I do have a written comment from Sonny saying COGS fully supports the Commission's recommendations on sustainability plan. Uh, again, other comments are of record. We'll go on to Austin Fairbanks, Patricia Badnock. Honorable Mayor and Council, good evening. My name is Austin Fairbanks. I'm a Scottsdale homeowner at 2938 North 61st Place, 85251. Uh, last Monday, I emailed each of you with my seven-page analysis of the proposed sustainability plan. I looked at each of the five thematic areas that the plan is considering and came to the unfortunate conclusion that the plan before you today is a Phoenix or Tucson-style climate action plan being introduced by the back door. 
I wanted to begin my comments here today by pointing out that Scottsdale contributes 0.00067% of all global greenhouse gas emissions. Even if we reach the 90% reduction threshold that the plan purports to aim for, it would impact less than seven millionths of total greenhouse gas emissions. I spent a lot of time in my report, which is on page 230 of your packet, trying to look at costs and benefits of these proposals, which um, are nebulous, but I try to quantify some of these things. Uh, for instance, energy strategy two, which is improved municipal energy performance, based on the average cost uh, that I identified in the report, it might cost $283 million from the city's taxpayers to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by, in the city's facilities by 90%. Uh, energy st strategy three, reduce the energy impact of the built environment through sustainable building practices and policies, comes with the goal of 10% of all buildings in Scottsdale being green buildings by 2035. But there's just one small problem. Even if 100% of all new buildings uh, at the current rate of construction in Scottsdale are green buildings, uh, we, if the current pace continues, we'll have 8.8% of all total buildings will be green buildings. So we won't even meet our standard if 100% are mandated to follow this green policy. And that's going to cost about $90 million worth of mandates just to hit that 8.8%, not reaching the 10% target. And those are just two examples where logic and fiscal prudence were frankly thrown out the door to accommodate this Green New Deal style agenda. Another area that this applies to is water conservation. Everyone recognizes that Scottsdale's in a desert, and Scottsdale citizens and residents have voluntarily reduced water usage by about 6.6% a year, according to the sustainability plan's data. But then it calls for reducing or more than doubling that pace over the next decade, even as city council is approving new developments. So I would also point out that setting a 14.5% reduction goal for residential water users versus a 10% reduction for commercial and HOA landscaping is unequal and it disproportionately targets residents. We're told this is an aspirational document, but if you were to adopt this plan, it would be a policy statement from council to staff that you want to meet these goals. And in many ways, the easiest way to achieve those goals is by increasing fees and imposing costly mandates. Many of the benign, more benign objectives of the plan are already ongoing, so you can continue converting LED light bulbs and replacing leaky water faucets without adopting this plan. And finally, if you're inclined to continue developing a sustainability plan, I would urge you to send this proposal back to the drawing board and instead look at resiliency and adaptation. I think those are two goals. If Scottsdale's gonna get hotter, and if we're gonna have less water in the future, uh, we need a plan for how we're gonna adapt to those changes. Um, but trying to socially engineer residents to reduce greenhouse gas emissions that to total seven millionths of total is a wrong approach. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next we have Patty, Patricia Badnock and then Paul Rowe and then Robbie uh, Lucha. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Patricia Badnock, uh, about 50 year resident of Scottsdale. This draft design, full of repeated suggestions, showing numerous abstract illustrations to educate through repetition that we must compromise our style of life in order to accommodate what? An overpopulated community? I say nothing is valid in this sustainability effort until you identify what build out is, for whom and for what. There is a vague reference where it says where we are and tied to targets about where we want to be. This is really about where you want to take us. I don't care how many open house opportunities you've held, it does not begin to document the truth from the many people I have talked to going door to door distributing campaign information. Then there is the audacity quote, keep Scottsdale safe, wild, and beautiful. I don't know what wild is. Is that the bar district or the STRs? <laughs> <laughs> then there's a maintain Scottsdale small town feel. Huh, that horse has already left the gate. Climate control, the controlling factor behind this so-called sustainability plan. Illustrated throughout is the spiked up graph going sky high and repeating that sustainability brainwash is showing last year's summer as being the hottest ever. Never let an extreme go to waste. It is so transparent for this to lend authenticity to our climate demise. I find it particularly disdainful 
that as taxpayers, we are flipping the bill to pay the salaries to all these staff members constructing displays, directing outcome to justify their own existence at our expense in multiple ways. And again, repetition is to brainwash. Well, <coughs> the new money is the new green. And more than one summer would lend better convincing we will see this soon. And finally, I also found it interesting of this repeated quote, there are no penalties if targets are not met. Is this some kind of a legalese? Thank you. Next we have um, Paul Rowe, Robbie Litcham, and Jim Haxby. Good evening, my name is Paul Rowe and I reside in, uh, on 78th place in Villa Monterey. Uh, Mayor Ortega, members of the City Council. Uh, as an 11 year old moving with my parents into Phoenix on Labor Day week in 1958 from Los Angeles, we were greeted by a city of about 365,000 in towns like Scottsdale with a population of 10,000, if that many. The air was crystal clear, traffic was minimal. <clears throat> Since then, the metropolitan area has grown by over tenfold, and Scottsdale is a burgeoning suburb of a quarter million. With this growth have come all the attendant benefits and drawbacks of a large urban area. Many days the air quality is diminished by a layer of haze and smog, and traffic is congested. Therefore, the question arises of how best to address the issue of maintaining the quality of life that we have become accustomed to while preserving a suitable environment is crucial. The current proposal put forth by the council includes a number of significant reductions in electric, water, and vehicle usage while imposing a series of reductions that threatened the very quality of life that we're accustomed to. Draconian measures put forth by a plethora of studies and recommendations by innumerable groups and individuals worldwide fail to take into account the particular requirements of the residents of our city. This could very well lead to a decline in the quality of life for Scottsdale residents rather than an improvement at significant cost and a loss of individual liberty. I might add that the presenter stated there were no mandates. If so, why have this to begin with, this proposal? And uh, stating also that the presenter stated in the early part of her presentation that was cost effective, then later said she could not estimate the total cost. Uh, with these things in mind, I highly re recommend that the council reject this draft plan wholesale. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next we have um, Jim Haxby, Bob Pegeman. Excuse me. Uh, did we get Robbie Leacham? Oh, okay, Robbie, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. Um, I didn't plan on speaking. I really don't have anything prepared. So thank you for the people before me. Um, my name is Robbie Lockheim. My wife and I are 38-year residents in Scottsdale and small business owners. We reside at 8602 East Hazelwood. Um, 85251, and we adamantly oppose the sustainability bill. Uh, this is the, the plan. Uh, I don't like the door that it opens. Um, and again, I appreciate the people that have come before me, and I think it, it's, it's a bad thing to open the door for this. So thank you. Thank you, Jim Haxby, Bob Pedgeman, and Jeff Call.
Uh, thank you, Mayor and uh, Council. I urge you to vote no on this uh, thing whatsoever. This plan is uh, full of idealistic visions <coughs> and mandates for the only purpose that some people can pat themselves on the back saying they've done something about the environment, which man's never done, and the residents of Scottsdale will suffer for it. It kind of reminds me of the campaign to replace paper bags with plastic years ago. We had to, we're going to save the forest by getting rid of all the paper bags. And what did we get for it? Plastic pollution in both the ocean and the ground. We didn't save it. We took something that was, re that was recyclable and replaced it with plastic. And this it's just what this scene reminds me of. There's no, there's no proof that any of this will be workable. That's why we don't have any repercussions if you don't comply with it. The plan will increase costs to the residents, especially the low-income residents of the city and the seniors living on fixed income. They're going to suffer and the irony of all that, of the residents paying more for, for services, for water and waste, is that we're approving apartments left and right. We're increasing the density and expecting the, the existing residents to pay for it on there. So it's, you know, I think it's time to scrap this plan and what we ought to really be thinking about is trying to figure out just what size of population can the infrastructure of Scottsdale handle? Not, not that we've got to build out, build out, and develop and develop. One part of it is, okay, we're going to rely on MAG to improve the air quality. Well, as a pilot flying in and out of here for 40 years, I can tell you that the air pollution in Scottsdale, or in, in the valley, has been here for a long, long time in those 40 years. But, but their solution is light rail, MAG's solution, and the residents of Scottsdale have said, no, we don't want light rail. So why are we pursuing that? So I think, you know, we, we've got a plan with no penalties and visions that, that have no proof and concepts, which are admirable, to improve the, the quality of our life, to reduce the heat, the quality of our water. But, but this plan isn't going to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Bob Pitchman, Jeff Cull. And by the way, could you put uh, slide number 13 back on the overhead? I think it was 13. Thank you, Mayor Ortega. Council members, name is Bob Pitchman, and addresses on the record. And... Um, Hey, who in Scottsdale doesn't support sustainability? I think every resident wants a sustainable Scottsdale in the quality of living, livability. And then I read the report, and way in the beginning it talks about historic drought. We don't have water. We have to protect the air quality and all of that. And the obvious question is, Ms. McNeil, you put this report together. Why did you ever not think about restricting overdevelopment because overdevelopment is what's making these things worse. So what kind of plan is this, guys? Seriously, you are going to put restrictions. This council has no problem putting restrictions on single-family homes, basically. You know, but it's got trouble putting restrictions on themselves, you guys. That, and I'm not talking about pri private property rights. Everybody's entitled to build to zoning. I'm talking about when you approve rezonings that result in three, four hundred units. So, and let's put it in perspective, we have about 14,000 units already in pipeline, and I'm sure you're going to be approving some more soon. But the hypocrisy is mind-numbing. Again, you want to adopt a sustainability plan that puts utility and service restrictions on residents, but you're not willing to put any restrictions on the number of additional multifamily units you create through deliberate upzonings. 
And so that's a pretty good system. You know, you approve apartment buildings, high density apartment buildings, which deplete utilities, resources. And then some of those developers give you campaign contributions. So you, you, you enrich them, they enrich some of you. And so what do you do then? Then you punish the residents. You restrict their usage. It's a pretty good deal, it's a pretty good system, but it's a pretty good deal for some of you here. It's not a good deal or a system for the residents. And I think that this has got to go back to the table and it's got to be made more equitable. And then make no mistake, the yes vote on this is a yes vote for Scottsdale New Green Deal. Thank you. Okay, next we have uh, Jeff Call is the final speaker, is that correct? Again, I'm looking for the City Council Action Requested slide. I thought it was number 13, if you could put that up, up on the uh, projection. I think it's page 13. <clears throat> Proceed. Thank you, sir. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Appreciate the opportunity to speak. Appreciate what you do to try to help the city. We're here tonight to discuss the sustainability issue facing the city of Scottsdale. Uh, like has been said, uh, you know, we're all for sustainability. We're all for the environment. There's never any question about that. For those people who have issues and want to bring these before the city council, it's, <clears throat> it's because we have issues with the specifics about these proposals. What we're finding here is uh, with this particular proposal that it's cloaked in flowery rhetoric that obscures the uh, unpleasant realities that are interwoven into the fabric of the entire fine print of this proposal. Some of the key issues here that I think most residents need to be aware of is that, for example, there's a 90% reduction in household waste that's being required, mandated, by this proposal, while at the same time increasing rates on the homeowner. And what that means then is that the 10% remaining waste that a homeowner has, assuming they hit the 90% reduction, is being penalized, the homeowner is being penalized, so that they have to uh, pay more to reduce their home to 90%, number one. Number two, there's 11.7% reduction in household water usage that's being required, demanded, asked for, whatever. There's also a rate increase that's being asked for for this, which is uh, uh, a penalty that's being imposed on a homeowner reducing their water usage by 12%. There's a penalty for being proactive, for accomplishing the goals of this proposal. There's the uh, mandate of, uh, Requirement for public transportation ride sharing to reduce pollution and ozone levels, and on and on. There's all these things going on within this proposal. So in other words, the sustainability program requires residents to produce less waste, use less water, drive less with their cars, all while paying more for the privilege of restricting their lifestyle and giving up their freedoms and the quality of the life that they're accustomed to and which they're striving for in this community. And this is all being initiated by some controlling agenda by some hidden bureaucrats. I don't know who these people are that are drafting these proposals, but I would like to know who they are. You know, I know there's all a lot of people involved, but there's some people that are really driving this. And uh, frankly, uh, I heard there's some people coming from out of state that have been hired by the city that uh, are running some of these things. Uh, so a couple questions I, I have is, uh, number one, who are these people? And number two, how can the city council, how can you, the city council, support a sustainability program requiring these restrictions on residents, yet approve more apartments that use more water, create more trash, generate more traffic and congestion? You can't have sustainability here in the city of Scottsdale, while at the same time approving these projects that are bringing in more people or using more water, creating more traffic, driving more cars, all these sort of things. You can't have it both ways. 
What, what are you going to do about that? Thank you, Mr. Call. Your time has expired. And I, I think you repeated that, sec, se, that last sentence, so we heard, we heard you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. At, at this point, um, we have uh, concluded public comment, and uh, we'll move on to uh, council deliberation. I see Councilwoman Janik, and then Councilmember Durham. I'll defer to Councilmember Durham to go first, if that's all right with him. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Janik. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I believe the sustainability plan is critical to the future of Scottsdale. And many people who uh, have spoken here tonight have recognized that. Uh, they've said, uh, we like sustainability, uh, we just don't want to pay for it. Uh, we don't want to suffer any benefits, uh, any detriments. But uh, I think it was Mr. Rowe pointed out, we have an air quality problem. Uh, we have an air quality problem today. Uh, we're under uh, uh, a bad air alert. And you look around and you can see that we have bad air today. And uh, we also have a fire near the preserve. Um, and some people have said, well, you know, we can't really do anything about it because we're only, you know, X percent of the world. Uh, but the fact is that um, uh, people will say we can't do anything, but we, uh, we have to. It's part of our commandment. Um, I was very impressed by, there's a discussion on page five of the sustainability program, which points out that we have a long history of practicing sustainability in Scottsdale. Uh, it stated that the Green Belt is the first non-structural flood system in the country. I didn't know that. Uh, that's an amazing fact, as Ms. McNeely pointed out. Uh, some people would have said, well, we don't want to spend the money. Let's just throw a concrete trough down the middle of Scottsdale. And can you imagine where we'd be if those people had won out? Uh, the people who didn't want to spend any money, didn't want to make Scottsdale beautiful. And in addition to the Green Belt, we have the Preserve, famous certainly over the country, the biggest urban park in the country. Uh, we've passed the environmentally sensitive land overlay and natural area open spaces. Our water treatment is some of the most sophisticated in the world. We have the first LED platinum fire station in the country. Uh, this council passed a mandatory green construction code um, just a year or two ago. Um, so we have been a leader in sustainability for many, many years, and we're not gonna stop now. Uh, there's an email circulating, many of you have probably read it, that says Scottsdale residents have long been the most committed to sustainability of any group in the, in the Phoenix area. I agree, we've been leaders in sustainability. But the same email goes on to say, well, we've done enough, it's time to stop, we've created the preserve, we have good water, so let's stop. We don't need to worry about sustainability anymore. And, and I, I think that's, frankly, it's a ridiculous argument. It's not time to stop. Look at our air quality today. This email and many others are filled with information. Uh, these emails and uh, many people have sent us emails as a re response to this first email. And uh, even though we've been working on this for two years, uh, uh, some people just kind of saw this email yesterday and, and responded for the first time. Um, these emails claim that we are introducing government mandates. Our, our last witness said that too, and I'm very disappointed in that because it's absolutely not true. Uh, I wish I had a dollar for every email that says we're introducing mandates. Uh, if I did, I, I'd pay for Mr. Beesmeyer's uh, sewer. Um, so I'd have plenty of money. Now, and, and some of this misinformation, unfortunately, it's, it's coming from inside the house, so to speak. Even some members of this council are spreading the false claim that we are putting forth mandates. But if you look at page eight of the plan, it very specifically says, this plan is an aspirational document and not a mandate. I don't know how we can be any clearer. 
I guess we could jump up on the dais and start waving our arms and screaming at the top of our lungs that we're not going to pass a mandate. But the truth is, we aren't. Uh, I, for one, would never pass a plan that includes mandates. Uh, we are going to apply common sense, at least as long as I'm on this council, we're going to apply common sense in moving forward with this plan. So um, where does that leave us for today? I, I, I think it's a too important, this plan is too important to pass it without making sure that we have it absolutely right. And I confess that I've waffled at times between considering this as a final project or as a work in product. But I could use a little bit more time on this. And more importantly, I think we must try to gain as much citizen support as we can. I realize that many people have concerns about some parts of this plan. It has many benefits. It's going to reduce uh, your water costs. Some of the very easy suggestions in here will reduce your water costs. If you can use less water, uh, use water efficient uh, appliances in your house, uh, water efficient faucets and so on. There are suggestions in here that will help you uh, save money. And if this plan can help you save water, that helps all of us and reduces your water bill. And if we can reduce trash, that's going to save money too. Um, so we have, but I think we have an obligation to make the benefits of this plan as clear as we possibly can. So my position on this is that um, I'm in favor of option C, which is that we continue adoption of this plan to a later date. Uh, in between, we have a series of open houses, and we've already had open houses on this, but I, I think we need to try to do it again to make it as clear as possible to the citizens uh, what all the benefits of this plan are. And we'll go through the emails, we'll go through the comments we've heard today, and we will try as best we can to spell out the benefits of this plan. And I expect all the keyboard warriors who have been on their uh, computers the last day to show up. Um, and I'm surprised that not many of them showed up tonight. And I want them to show up and listen and listen in good faith. That's the most important thing. And pay attention. We've been working on this a long time. So I don't think people should blindly follow an email that they got yesterday, the day before this goes to the council. I know we're never gonna convince anyone. Uh, some people thrive on disinformation and finding the government boogeyman behind every door. And we all recognize that's for political purposes, much of it. It also reminds me of the Oscar Wilde quotation uh, that a cynic is someone who knows the cost of everything and the value of nothing. Well, there's a lot of people out there who are looking at the cost of everything and don't appreciate the value. That's one of the reasons I appreciate that Ms. McNeely brought up uh, the green belt again. Perfect example. Uh, I'm, I'm so glad we didn't look at the cost of the green belt and we considered the value of it. Uh, this plan has value that we can't ignore. And I'd like to remind you from the last session we have, uh, we have some of the lot lowest in the valley, water and sewer and trash rates. We have one of the lowest tax rates. So we have a history of um, protecting citizens in Scottsdale. And we will continue to do that. So Mr. Mayor, I would uh, move to... Um, option C? Yes, I would move option C that we move our resolution 13107 to a later date to allow at least uh, two community outreach uh, sessions. Thank you. Councilwoman Janik? Um, I'll second that motion, but I also want to speak to it. First of all, I want to thank Lisa for all the work she has done. She has had to try to bridge the gap between citizens who are resistant to this and a commission that is very forward thinking. So thank you for your patience in dealing with all this. Um, and you need to know that we've already done sustainability on water and there is still more work to do. We've always done sustainability on solid waste 
and yet there is still more work to do. We have had successes. We will continue to have successes. I believe that we are capable of moving the needle on availability of water, on heat, on air pollution. And as far as proof of concept, as a scientist and a science teacher, I want to remind you that Alexander Fleming, when he discovered penicillin, did not have proof of concept. When we walked on the moon for the first time, we did not have proof of concept. And finally, when we came up for successful treatments for AIDS, okay, we did not have proof of concept. That is how we evolve as a people with more scientific advancements, with more technology. The right now, we really can't outline because we're working to develop these and they will come about. So the other thing I'm very confident of is that unless we embrace you, the people, to want to be part of this, we will not be successful. We cannot force it on you again. It is something that you have to accept have to believe in. And I think because of Scottsdale, and because of our history as a great city, and because of what much of what uh, Councilman Tom said, that we have the ability to advance. You say, I don't want to pay for this. Well, how good is our city going to be if it gets 10 degrees warmer for three months in, this, in the summer? How good is our city going to be if we don't have enough water, which is a finite resource? I think that we can all accomplish this by working together. And know that cost over time, when you come up with new technology, goes down. It's not a linear relationship that it goes up. If you double it, it doubles in cost. That's not true. The cost of modern technology goes down over time. So I know that there are a lot of concerns. I don't like it when people cut and paste what one person says, and then I get 100 emails. If you really believe you show up for the meetings, you come up with your own ideas, just like you have no idea how many hours all of us have worked uh, with this specific project. It's been since I started about three and a half years ago. So where were you three and a half years ago? You were ignoring everything that was going on. And again, the cost of inaction may be far, far higher than the cost of action. You need to remember that. And I agree that, yes, there are problems. Yes, we need to explain it better. And I think that we will. We will take the time. We will answer the emails. Because again, if you don't believe in it, we won't go anywhere with it. So I ask you to be open to these ideas, to be critical of them, but don't say, I hate this plan. I don't want to tell you how many of those emails I got. Darn it, tell me what you don't like and don't cut and paste it from somebody else's email. Read it, understand it, and say, well, you know what? I don't think this is gonna be possible because with air pollution, it's tough because we are doing a good job with air pollution, but other parts of the community are not, and yet we're all suffering with high ozone days. So I realize that. I realize we probably have to pull back on some of these, but I also believe there's a lot of them that will propel us forward into the future. So again, I support option C. I think that we need more time, more effort, and I think we need to convince you of the benefits based on what we've already done as a city. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Graham, Councilwoman Littlefield. First, I wanna start by saying that I don't appreciate anyone from up here casting aspersions about you, the residents, who are taking time to send us feedback, throwing out smears like keyboard warriors, or being critical of the kind of feedback you send us. I don't think we should be doing that. Everyone wants a sustainable Scottsdale, and everyone wants to conserve our natural resources. Our city leads in water innovation, open space, energy efficiency, and environmental awareness. We say as much of this, as much in our general plan that Scottsdale embraces environmental conservation and ample access to our magnificent open spaces. And as many things that I like about this document, 
There are too many of the proposals that either go too far or leave basic questions unanswered. I've studied the evolution of this document very closely over the past year plus, and I have offered my suggestions during our work study sessions. While I support many of its precepts, um, including the following, raising awareness about drought conditions and the importance of water conservation, stressing the importance of shade to combat the heat island effect, understanding how our use of energy and production of waste affects our environment, and continuing to expand city-level programs such as the grass-to-turf conversion. For starters, the sustainability plan should incorporate financial and population sustainability, whereas this document ignores those, limiting its focus to climate. We know the plan doesn't expressly set, cli doesn't expressly set climate mandates, but we also know that it will alter and influence major decisions made by this and future councils. We've gotten hundreds of emails from residents who are either confused or find elements of the plan too extreme. In our work studies, I strongly urged my colleagues to soften some of the plan's sharp edges. During those meetings, staff would often offer two options, a less aggressive goal and a more extreme goal. Unfortunately, the council majority chose the extreme goal almost every time. Which, and, that, and those extreme goal selections are in the document that are before you today. Some of the areas that we could moderate as I went through and studied the plan and present a, a plan and document that's more balanced to you, the residents, includes asking residents um, to reduce their refuse by 90% within 15 years. This is one of the plan's goals that I think must be moderated. I don't believe it's our job to police residents like that. And I'm concerned that this is going to lead to toxic illegal dumping. Dave Bennett, our city waste manager, told the city council in one of our work studies that this goal, unless new technology is invented, this goal will require raising your uh, rates on, on waste materials. It also raises the questions, where, where are residents going to put their trash? It's not good leadership if we can't answer that basic question. Increasing citywide uh, tree canopy from 13 to 25 percent. I want more shade as much as anyone, but the city manager tells us that this goal requires land, water, and millions of dollars that we don't have. It should be noted that the city has just started a shade study. If some of you went to the shade, one of the shade uh, open houses last week, and I think those results at finish it, finalizing that shade study could better inform this plan. It's not good leadership to codify something when staff tells us it's impractical and it contradicts other goals. Air quality. The plan is light, in, light on details and simply refers us to follow the Maricopa Association of Governments. It's not good leadership to outsource our decisions to the next level of government and their political issues. We've seen how deferred decision making has caused issues in the recent past. Water reduction. We are in a drought and we need to use less water. I support more than voluntary measures in order, in order to secure our water future. And that's why I supported the pre preventing front lawns on new builds and the lawn to gravel incentive. However, we contradict this goal with the tree canopy goal, which requires more water. <clears throat> there is simply only one way to achieve the goal of this, of this, to, to achieve this goal, and that is to increase residents' water bills. And if you read the section in this draft plan, the measure goes very easy on commercial entities and very tough on residents. It's not good leadership to both contradict the same document, then to clamp down on residents while giving commercial entities a pass. Consistent enforcement is good leadership. So as I stated, I support much of the concepts of this document. However, other areas simply boil down to impacting residents' basic cost of living. We not only hear about it, we often discuss how living costs are higher with inflation and economic uncertainty, beleaguering our residents who are struggling to make ends meet. Some up here may argue 
that residence costs are going to go up anyway. And to that I would respond, why would you want to make it even worse? So based on these considerations and, con and concerns, um, I agree with uh, the motion that's on the table to defer this for as long as possible, get as much feedback as possible until we get as much support as possible um, so we can sharpen our pencils and find a better balance between meeting sustainability goals and the burdens that this document would place on you, the residents, now and in the long run. Thank you, Mayor. Councilwoman Littlefield. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you all, every one of you here tonight and who's listening in for all the emails that I have received over the last couple of weeks from our citizens. I was amazed at the number of emails, the interest that all of you showed in this, and the concerns that were presented to me. All but two of those hundreds of emails said no. That's not reaching out to our citizens. There are several things I have concerns about regarding the sustainability plan. All of the goals sound great, and yes, there are goals. However, my concerns mostly revolve around the unintended consequences of what some of these actions are that are contemplated. Let's look at some of the plans, plans goals, and targets. Waste reduction goal. Households to reduce waste and trash by 90% in 15 years. The solid waste manager told council this would require increasing rates to households. To me, this raises concerns about folks possibly dumping their trash in our preserve, along roadsides, or in trash bins and parks, thus filling them up faster than anticipating, anticipated. We need to look for unintended consequences when we start considering these kinds of goals, rules, and laws. Water reduction goal. Households to reduce water consumption 1.3% per year until 2033. That's 11.7% in nine years. In 10 years, it's 13%. To reach this goal, it is anticipated that the city will have to raise water rates. This is in the plan. So we will have to raise your rates so you can have less water. There, where is the incentive to do this? Shouldn't we be reducing your rates if you strive to meet this goal? It seems to me that we're backwards here. Air quality goal. This is in alignment with MAG's goal to reduce ozone. As the city's MAG representative, I can tell you point blank their first goal is to get you out of your cars and into public transportation, buses, and light rail. This is not what our citizens want. This is what MAG wants. And you have told us many times you do not approve this. Heat extreme, extreme heat goal. We have that in Scottsdale. To solve the Scottsdale problem, our sustainability plan wants to increase the citywide tree canopy from 13% to 25%. Now, I'm a native here, and I love trees. I'm sorry, I just do. But where are we going to get either the water or the millions of dollars that it would take to do this? Does this not conflict with our goal of reducing our overall water? usage. Also, where are we going to get the land to plant all these trees? Force you to put trees in your yards so then you have to water them with reduced water allotments? This greatly reduces the number of trees in all of Scottsdale and it requires more water and more people to maintain these trees which translates into more cost. The plan doesn't pay, say how to pay for them or how to pay to care for them. So, or where the land is that we would need to plant them. Energy goal number five, citywide electricity reduction of 15% in 10 years, regardless of energy source. Since we all purchase our energy from APS and SRP, we would have to use city resources to monitor our city's energy users. That would be you. So would the staff oversee our energy efficiency and usage, both for you and for your businesses? 
Would there be fines if you use too much as prescribed by the city, regardless of life changes or needs? Since when have we, as citizens, given the city the kind of power or right to monitor our homes and our businesses and our lives to this kind of extent? Also, does this include the vast number of apartments already approved but not yet built, but I'm sure that will require energy? Reducing total power outage while increasing vast numbers of users means less power availability for everyone. And of course, higher fees. When the idea of, for a sustainability plan first came up, I was thinking of voluntary ways that we could find to continue to use and reduce waste and help our environment, much like our citizens have already done. Scottsdale is known for this. I was not looking for an environment police force to report energy users to city authorities and possibly fine citizens for their increases in usage needs. For me, this goes far too uh, uh, far and makes Scottsdale look less of a desirable place to live for our residents and for our businesses who also use energy. Scottsdale has worked hard to become a very environmentally friendly city. Our citizens want this, and we've proven it over the years time and time again. However, we do not want to be coerced. I can think of no way that would be worse than to try to gain citizen support than coercing them. We need to ask them. We need to involve them to find ways that are mutually satisfactory to everyone. Indeed, all of the many, many emails that I received sent this same message, involve us. A very loud no was sent in these emails. Out of the hundreds I got, I got two yeses. I have never, ever, in the 10 years I've been on council, received this kind of unanimous response from our citizens on a council issue before, any issue. I think this needs a huge review, not only of staff, but with our residents as well. I am very concerned about the unintended consequences that this and the total cost of it, both monetarily to our citizens and with our quality of life to our citizens. Neither of these have been fully investigated. It's one thing to offer options to residents to reduce negative environmental impacts. And I believe that that would be accepted by at least most to consider. Scottsdale is a very eco-friendly city. It has been for many, many years. However, it's quite another thing to introduce involuntary hard-line demands monitored and enforced by the city until we look more and more like a police state. This is that first step, and I don't want to take it. Also, one issue on the social welfare side to consider is how all of these increases in costs in apartment living will affect those who are currently teetering on the brink of homelessness. Increases in utility costs translate into increases in rent. This would hurt many of our poorest citizens who are on the edge of homelessness and cannot afford these kinds of increases. It boils down to higher prices, higher taxes, and less freedom. How much higher and how much less is uncertain at this time. It has not been defined, nor has it been discussed with our citizens. However, it certainly points the way to more autocratic control by the city over our citizens' personal and private lives. Also, I did not see where the plan addresses the expected increase in population that Scottsdale is going to have over the coming years. Increasing the number of apartments, homes, and businesses bring with them an increase in power usage, numbers of cars on our roads, increase in water needs, trash pickup, etc. And I did not see any of that factored into the plan, and I think it should be. Finally, the plan seems unduly interested in fines and control techniques to hold over the heads of our citizens. Every single goal had that. 
For me, the kind of sustainable plan for these kinds of lifestyle changes in Scottsdale need to come from the bottom up, not the top down. Changes like these over many, many years, they last for many, many years. And I do not believe they are what our citizens are looking for. Scottsdale is known for a better quality of life in line with the living standards of our citizenry while not enduring the degradation of either. I think this plan needs a great deal more thought, definitely more interaction with our citizens, and a deep dive into a realistic analysis of what each part of this plan would cost to both our citizens and to our city, both in lifestyle changes and monetary cost. Because of all these factors, I cannot approve this plan tonight, but I will go with option three to continue discussing it, and I hope discussing it with many of our citizens here who will be affected by the future of the decisions made regarding this plan. Thank you. Councilwoman Caputi. I just have a brief comment. I, I feel like we've all read completely different plans because <laughs> I don't really Thank understand you. a lot of these comments, but um, I just want to make the general comment that, you know, our city is the gold standard of the valley. Um, I think the point of the plan is just to recognize that we want to be good stewards with our scarce resources, particularly um, for the next generation. I didn't read anywhere in the plan that we were doing any sort of government mandates or asking people to do anything. So again, I feel like I'm, I've, I've read a completely different plan. I definitely support continuing. I think we got an awful lot of comments. I'm a little bit confused about why we didn't hear from folks earlier. We've done outreach meetings for, I don't know, at least the last year, I think maybe even more, two years. So I'm, again, we've been, this has been a very long, slow, deliberate process. We've been um, meeting with residents continually, getting feedback, trying to revise the plan, trying to keep it as uh, big picture and aspirational as possible. So again, I'm a little bit confused about why everyone's coming back now and insisting it's very specific. Um, totally fine with continuing, but I heard from everyone in the room tonight that they care passionately about sustainability, that it's very important to you, that you do want our beautiful gold standard city to be here, not just for today, but into the future. And people had a lot of things that they didn't like about the plan, which again, confused me since to me it's so big picture and aspirational, but I would just say that if we push this off indefinitely, um, I would greatly welcome people's comments. It's really easy to say what you don't like, but I'm sitting here wondering what people actually would like to see in the plan. I would invite, <laughs> I thought we already did this, but I would, you know, everyone's saying we want to be sustainable, we want more sustainability. I, I guess I'm confused about what people think that looks like. So um, I'm totally fine supporting C, but I, I would love to hear what, what the ideal sustainability plan would look like, because I guess now I'm just completely confused. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I do support the motion and um, have a few comments. So every household, every city, and the general public feels a squeeze when it comes to energy, energy costs, water, water conservation, waste, air quality, and the heat. We all feel it. We all have to deal with larger bills and the consequences of each of those areas. This is a very important, it's more than an exercise. Now, when the topic of waste is brought up, the fact is that we are running out of landfills. To say there are no controls on landfills and we can't take, yeah, you know, why do that? Well, the fact is we are running out of landfills. We all have to acknowledge that. We can't wake up 15 years from now and say, you know what, there's no place to dump it because we didn't uh, at least change direction, either packaging, either uh, recycling, some other mo model because there is not an infinite uh, uh, factor in land for landfills. That's just a fact. The same thing is with water. 
The rates that have been uh, pay, uh, people that we pay for bulk water have almost tripled. And I say I knew they doubled, but the federal government is compensating at a rate that's three times what the water was when, we fir when I first entered office, okay? All, it is federal water, whether it's from SRP or whether it's from CAP. We pay for it, we compete with other cities that pay for it, and the federal government is saying that is a scarce resource. We cannot ignore that as the municip municipal component and all of the municipalities, whether they're using SRP or SRP, uh, CAP water, have to get involved in a proactive way, right? And that's a positive message. It's a positive message because uh, even the, uh, the air pollution and uh, questions about traffic, well, we, all of the traffic is interconnected one way or the other for surface streets across the valley. We can't shut off the, the Indian school on our end or expect somebody else to do it on the other end. Somehow it has to you know, operate as a, a full system. What we're leading to with this is that these five elements will require further input, not misinformation, because we can weigh the tonnage, because we have two operations happening. One is the city's own operations. How efficient can we be? How, what are the expectations for the residents here? They expect us to employ the best technology to, to save their taxpayer or ratepayer money. That's an expectation that we have. We have shown and we have said, part of this sustainability plan said, we can save 15% of our energy use within our own buildings and still deliver a very good uh, library, fire station, and all those things. Those are things that we want. Those are things that are positive expectations within our own house. It's, it's, it's uh, in a way of demand. We see that same demand from a citizen taxpayer saying, give me value. Make sure you're not wasting. Why? Because uh, they, that's their expectation. In our own household, the squeeze is on. Save energy, save water. Why? Because it's costing mom and dad money or the older group money. And we're, we're, uh, the inflation factors as well are all putting the squeeze on us. So it's not escapable. And this, uh, this is not an exercise, this is not a drill. This is a useful, constructive way of finding some answers together. Earlier we talked about competing with other cities for water pipe and pumps and all these things. Well, there's a push and pull because they can only produce so many of the, of the uh, infrastructure, pipe and, and so forth that we need. We're competing with that each, one another. And that's why we, uh, Scottsdale has always been known as um, a, a very involved community. Uh, certainly the perception of saying, wow, uh, you know, we're going to reduce uh, waste. Well, if we don't have a place to dump it, and we don't start reducing now, in five years and 10 years, it's gonna be a huge problem. And um, the other thing that I like about this is that uh, it is asking for measurable results, measurable to find out whether or not any actions will save water. Uh, when we talk about trees, the monsoons blow down about 200 trees every season. <laughs> we replace them, right? And some of them have aged out and they've fallen over, right? So all of that is a maintenance as well as a sustainable way that our city works together. We will continue as council to look for high value return in every category in our own house and municipal ways. With that, we have a motion and a second. Please record your vote. It's unanimous and with that we have concluded